Uh, my name is Timothy Hennix. I'm the uh, Director of Engineering here at DustCon Solutions. And today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, combustible dust testing. Uh, we're going to figure out what it takes to determine whether or not your uh, material that you're handling uh, poses a risk for flash fire or explosion. Uh, during this recording, uh, we are going to be making it available later to anybody who is not able to be on the call uh, during this webinar. So uh, you should be seeing a link to that uh, after the broadcast concludes, and you'll be able to also go to YouTube and find this at any time if you'd like to wish, you know, if you'd like to share it with your team. Uh, I will be doing a uh, some polls and, and a survey will show up shortly following the webinar. Please take the time to, uh, to utilize that survey, give us some feedback. What are we doing well? What are we doing poorly? I fully expect that there's gonna be a lot of feedback saying, hey, we couldn't hear you for the first five minutes. And uh, I, I would, that's fair. I, I would really appreciate hearing that. So um, questions, uh, a lot of you have figured out already how to use the questions uh, box here that says uh, uh, you, know, you can ask me questions at any time. I'll be able to answer them e either in real time or at the end. We'll have a, a section of the presentation specifically devoted to Q&A. So again, about me, I'm a uh, professional engineer here in the state of Florida. I'm the director of engineering at DustCon Solutions. And we are a safety, process safety consulting group focused on combustible dust hazards. Uh, we're located in West Palm Beach. And we've got over 20 years of experience on the NFPA technical committees. Combustible dust is what we specialize in. It's what we do. Uh, for those of you who are in need of these services, we do offer uh, combustible dust hazard analysis. Uh, a full suite of dust testing services. That's exactly what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, combustible dust training, so we can come on site or we can uh, you know, do that online or web-based. And then there's some other services that, that we do as well with some of our clients who need uh, additional work uh, beyond those top three. So we already went through our poll. We, uh, I got 75% of you guys on the line who have uh, voted and let us know that it uh, looks like 53% of us are, uh, you know, kind of know our way around combustible dust testing, but definitely not an expert. 41% uh, of newbies, and then 6% uh, of us are experts. So, uh, you know, those, those of us who uh, are ready to open their own test lab, please give me feedback on how I'm doing. So, combustible dust, what is it? Uh, NFPA uh, is the guiding document here in North America. So, you're going to be hearing me talk about NFPA quite often in this presentation. For those of you not in the United States or Canada or somewhere where you've got another standard that you use, uh, there's certainly other uh, ways to uh, classify dust and classify dust hazards. But like I said, we're going to be focused on uh, NFPA. So combustible dust is generally thought of as finely divided solids that have high surface area uh, to mass ratios that can be suspended into a cloud and on ignition will uh, pose a flash fire and explosion hazard. Typically, this means that the material's got to be pretty fine. You know, less than 500 microns. Uh, just to give you guys an idea, that's about table sugar or below in terms of gran uh, granule size. Uh, particle size and moisture content play a huge role in the combustibility of your material, and we're going to get into that a little bit more uh, as we go through the presentation. I've listed here a uh, you know a couple of different uh, commonly handled combustible dusts. Uh, this is by no means a an exhaustive list. But it gives you an idea of just how common it is to find combustible dust used, you know, not only in industrial settings where, where we're handling and we, and we see these, uh, these hazards, but also in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, you know, sugar or coffee. You know, we see these things in our kitchen every day, and it's that uh, familiarity with it 
that typically allows us to become a little bit complacent. Uh, you know, it makes us think that maybe there's not such a maybe there's not such a hazard there. Um, so why are we talking about this? Uh, combustible dust has been a uh, a really important topic for the last 15 to 20 years here in North America. Uh, following a number of different uh, high profile explosions during the 2000s, including the West Pharmaceuticals explosion that you see here, uh, the Chemical Safety Board put together a report outlining finding, findings from uh, you know, 20 years worth of combustible dust incidents, you know, recommending and urging that OSHA make strides to uh, improve worker safety when it comes to combustible dust hazard, hazards. Uh, in response to that, OSHA did move forward with a national emphasis program, uh, and they incidentally reissued that national emphasis program after the imperial sugar explosion in 2008. So there's a number of requirements within NFPA, which is the National Fire Protection's most recent edition of 652. Now this is the starting point for all combustible dust users who are uh, moving forward with some type of protection plan. It outlines the different steps that you need to take. And today we're gonna be talking about that first and crucial step, determining the explosibility of the material that you're handling. That's found in chapter five. So pop quiz. Uh, I'm not gonna throw the poll up there for you guys, but uh, you know, just be honest with yourself as we go through each one of these questions. Let me know which, you know, I, I'd love to hear in the feedback uh, whether or not you guys got all these right. So first one, who's responsible for determining the, the explosibility of your dust? It's the owner operator of the facility. It's not your insurance company. It's not the group who's, it's not, it's not the group who's providing you your dust collector. It's not the ocean inspector. It's your responsibility to make sure that you understand yes or no is your uh, material explosible. Second, if you've got no incidents at your facility in the past, maybe you've been running 50 years and you've never seen your, never seen any kind of fire explosion with the material you're handling. Is, can you use that as your basis of safety? Can you say that your material is not explosible for this reason? False. We definitely can't do that. NFPA 682 specifically tells us we can't do that. And the reason for that is the, the same reason that uh, we wear a seat, seat belt every day. You know, just because I've not been in an accident on I-95 as I drive to work every day, doesn't mean that it can't happen. So uh, that's why we use these dust tests and uh, other industry best practices uh, and good engineering standards to understand the hazards of our materials and take uh, diligent steps to abating that risk. Is it acceptable to assume the materials is explosible without performing dust testing? Actually, yes it is. Uh, the reason for that is that we're taking a conservative approach. When unknown, we assume the material is combustible and we move forward from there. Uh, finally, documentation of the test results or whatever data it was that we used to determine explosibility needs to be uh, maintained by the facility for the life of the process. That again is true. You know, that documentation is gonna help to make sure that as you go through any changes in your process in the future, that the reasons for the determination of not using uh, explosion protection or specific uh, en engineering or administrative controls gets passed along uh, as there's turnover at your engineering positions or as your, at, at your safety positions, so on and so forth. So NFPA 652 allows us to make a uh, determination of uh, combustibility based on one of two things. Number one, we use industry published values. We can use the tables in the back of NFPA 652. We can use uh, textbooks or uh, vendor data banks. With all that knowledge that we've gained over the years, we can utilize that. Or we can do dust testing on our own. We can go ahead and 
pack up a sample, send it to a lab, we can get that, uh, that information firsthand. And again, the absence of previous incidents is not going to be able to be used for a basis for saying it's not combustible. That doesn't mean that there's not certain materials that we know from experience are not combustible dust. Limestone, for instance, certainly not a combustible dust. You don't have to have it tested. We have that understanding in the past. But if you're making a specialty chemical or a resin that nobody else is making, um, and there probably is not the same kind of uh, industry published data on your, your material, maybe nobody's ever even asked the question or done the test in the first place. Those are the times in which uh, we're going to need to be using this kind of uh, dust testing strategy. So, industry published data sources. Uh, these are three of my favorite. These are the places that I go if uh, Dust Con Solutions vendor, uh, you know, our internal database doesn't have the data that I'm looking for. First is NFPA 652. It's got a wealth of explosibility data in Annex A. Now you can go through those tables, you can find a lot of the most commonly uh, handled materials. Next is dust explosions in the process industries. This is the go-to book for combustible dust safety, written by Rolf Eckhoff. I think he's coming up, you know, it's the, the third or fourth edition now. Uh, you know, there's some really good information in there. Again, you know, he's just got tables in the back full of combustible dust explosivity data. And then finally, uh, we call this the German da database or the IFA data database. This is a searchable data bank open to the public that can be used to determine uh, combustibility values. Now with all of these, um, we're gonna have to be a little bit careful about uh, making sure everything's representative. But before we get to that, what about the safety data sheet? You know, surely safety data sheets have the information for combustibility on there, right? Wrong. Safety data sheets are usually inadequate. Typically, they're not going to have the key explosivity parameters that you're looking for. Now, take this one, for example. This is linear low de density polyethylene. Uh, linear low density polyethylene, uh, you know, this was provided in a pellet form. And to be quite honest with you, working with the end user, we just weren't sure whether or not it was even a combustible dust. So we were trying to figure out whether or not uh, you know, there were certain uh, parameters that we could determine in the lab so that we could avoid using some of the expensive engineering controls that you might find. Now, uh, on the SDS for this material, it had a broad statement that says, dust may form explosive atmosphere. But, within the physical and chemical properties, they didn't have anything there. There was no KST value, there was no minimum explosive concentration or ignition energy or ignition temperatures. You know, there was not much for us to go on. So we went forward with the testing, we were able to learn something from it. So using published data, there's gonna be both advantages and disadvantages. The advantages of using your published data is it's a quick reference. You can, under, you, know, you can understand what the KST and Pmax is for values. You know, this is really useful for those of you who are going to be designing explosion protection systems, uh, pneumatic convey companies or you know, silo manufacturers or uh, somebody working for an explosion protection company. We're doing these types of calculations uh, for look, you know, looking to find what the vent area is or the suppression strategy is on a daily basis. The really good that you know the, using these values is a quick reference tool, especially for things like sugar or grain dust that you can you know kind of recycle in a lot of different um, applications. It also saves money on testing. You know the stuff's not necessarily cheap, and you can utilize your um, your resources best in some cases when you you forego the testing and you just go you know you just utilize a number that. We, we've got a pretty good idea of what this material is going to do. And then the other part of it is, uh, you know, from a safety standpoint, you know, most of these uh, published values are going to be relatively conservative. So if anything, you're going to be overprotecting. That leads us into some of these, uh, these disadvantages, because although most will give a conservative result, not all of them will. And it may end up 
um, under predicting your risk, leaving you with, uh, leaving you with uh, an incident of loss or injury because you weren't protected adequately. Or on the flip side of that coin, you might be overprotected. You might be spending a lot of money on a, an engineered system or an extra, you know, doubling your vent area requirement because you didn't go out and, uh, and determine what that KST T max was in the first place. And, you know, even though you were able to save that couple thousand dollars worth of dust testing, you might be spending 10 or $20,000 down, uh, down the road to protect against a hazard that's just not there. And then again, you know, I mentioned before, make sure that we're, we're, uh, viewing these, uh, these values with a grain of salt, so to say, uh, particle size and moisture content are key. If you're looking at it uh, for material that has a different particle size and different moisture content, uh, that context matters. And you might end up coming away with uh, you know, misleading information because we didn't have all the information up front. So to drive that point home, I wanted to give you two different examples of sugar coming from that IFA database that I showed you earlier. So moisture content uh, and particle size matter. And what we're gonna see is that our risk increases as our particle size decreases. So right here, we've got on our left, sugar that has a median particle size of 290 micron. 290 micron, you can think of as like table sugar. It's granulated sugar. We compare that with powdered sugar. Medium value, median value for our particle size is 32 micron. And now there's huge difference in the way these are gonna behave though. I mean, low explosion, you know, our, our MEC, our minimum explosive concentration, is going to be sitting here at uh, 30 grams per cubic meter versus 500. That's a huge difference. KST value, you might be looking at uh, over 100 versus 16. So as we look at this uh, combustible dust problem, we need to make sure that we are um, evaluating the hazards uh, for the particle size and the moisture content that we're actually using. So now we're gonna talk, uh, talk about determining the explosibility in the lab setting. There's a number of different tests that we run. Here's a quick description of the process flow that we typically use when we're working with customers to determine those different, uh, those different parameters. So first and foremost, what are we doing in terms of uh, collecting a sample and preparing the sample? When we're collecting our sample, we wanna make sure we're taking, again, that keyword, representative samples. You might be sweeping off the floor, but it might be better to sweep off rafters, top of equipment, uh, directly off of the filter bags or your cartridges in the collector. And the reason for that is that as you are uh, as you're collecting that combustible dust sample, we're looking to ensure that we're getting, um, you know, a, a reasonable distribution of what we're actually going to see airborne in the facility. So once you send it to the lab, you, you secure it in sample storage that's, you know, something that's not going to allow moisture or uh, spillage. Uh, a lot of times, uh, double zipped, or you know, excuse me, uh, you know, double bagging in, uh, you know, freezer style plastic bags or uh, using, you know, plastic jars with sealable lids. Those are really good things to use. You just want to make sure that it's not showing up to our lab, uh, making a mess and, and, and getting all over everything. You ship it to us via UPS or FedEx, similar carrier in a uh, cardboard container, something like that. And then we have the option to either test the material as received or per protocol. As received means that we're going to be, uh, we're going to be uh, 
taking it directly out of the packaging that you sent it to us. We're going to test it just like that. Uh, now, this is to some people saying that it's getting a more realistic result. Uh, there's no drying, there's no particle size reduction. Just as the sample comes in, is just as the sample goes out. Uh, now, conversely, we can also do it per ASTM protocol. Now, this, uh, this refers to uh, the ASTM 12.6 protocol and the recommended particle size and moisture content to ensure that we're getting results that will envelop a number of different scenarios, not just that specific time and place that you captured your sample. Now, what this means is that we're going to use either a sieve or a grinder to reduce the particle size down from um, whatever it comes in at to uh, values less than 75 micron. It means that we're going to be drying that sample to less than 5% moisture content. It's going to give us kind of a, a worst case scenario. It gives us you know, a conservative result that can uh, be used for a broad range of applications throughout your facility. <laughs> now, a look inside our lab. Uh, some of you guys may uh, remember this. This is one of my, uh, my favorite shows from about 10 years ago, Mythbusters. And what you're gonna see here is these guys are gonna attempt to ignite uh, a large amount of coffee creamer. And what's interesting about this is it's not that different than the go, no, go test that we use in the lab. They're just doing it on a much larger scale, right? So you see here the coffee creamer, they disperse it throughout this, this large barrel and they've got their flare as their ignition source. And all this material is being pumped in using compressed air and you see the fireball. It might be the most expensive go no go test that's ever been performed. So that brings us into uh, the first uh, of the lab tests that I'm going to talk about today, the go no go test. So the go no go test is uh, a quick and um, a quick and dirty way for us to determine whether or not the sample can ignite and whether or not we should move forward with other tests. Now there's a couple of different methods that we can use here. Uh, there's a, like I said, a quick and dirty method, which is the uh, modified Hartman apparatus. It's based on the European VDI 2263 standard, where we're using a, a Hartman tube, which is much smaller, it's about one liter and we're using an electric arc uh, as the ignition source. Now this is gonna give us, uh, you know, if we get a go result with this Hartman tube, you know, we have an awfully good idea that it's gonna go in 20 liter sphere. But uh, because a, uh, NFPA 652 references the ASTM 1226 protocol, we also use the 20 liter sphere uh, to confirm that we have a go result. In order to do this kind of testing, we need about one sample worth of dust from you. When you get your results, it'll look something like this. Uh, I tried to select one that uh, was a little bit interesting here. Uh, you know, we see here that the results from the go no go screening were actually inconclusive uh, from the first time we tried it on the, the modified Hartman tube. Uh, that inconclusive means that we saw marginal flame propagation. It wasn't a big, bright explosion like you might expect. So what we did, we went back and we uh, attempted to do it in the 20 liter chamber. That 20 liter chamber, we see that we get an explosion over pressure, pressure of 6.1 bar. Now that is a healthy, uh, healthy propagation within the 20 liter sphere. We're pretty darn sure that it's not just an overdriven reaction and we can move forward with confidence that this is a combustible dust. So now that we've got that, uh, that answer for ourselves that we do have a combustible dust that we're working with, how strong is the explosion? And that's where we use the other parts of the ASTM uh, 1226 protocol 
to determine those values I've referenced a couple of times earlier, KST and Pmax. KS, er, uh, Pmax is the maximum pressure that's generated within the vessel during this testing, and KST is a measure of how quickly it gets there. It's actually the normalized maximum rate of rise of the pressure, and you can see that formula here that we use. It's useful for determining uh, parameters needed for explosion protection systems like venting, isolation, containment, and, and um, we need about two pounds of this in order to move forward. You see here on the right that we have both the 20 liter sphere and the one cubic meter chamber. You know, those are the two different vessel sizes that are commonly used to perform this test. Uh, the 20 liter sphere, you might say, is the workhorse of uh, combustible dust testing. It's small enough that it gives repeatable uh, results in a fashion that we can, you know, uh, keep moving with the testing. Uh, lab technicians can get in there, they can clean it out quickly, and you can knock out, you know, a couple of dozen runs uh, in a day versus the, the one cubic meter sphere. You need a lot more material and it takes a lot longer to do. So if we take a look here, this comes directly from the 1226 document. It gives it, you know, it gives you an idea of what's happening during uh, the deflagration testing. This upper left hand uh, graph that we're gonna show, you see how after your uh, materials dispersed in the uh, vessel, you've got your normal pressure, and then on ignition, you shoot up to your PX. Px is simply the explosion pressure for that particular trial. You plot those against the number of, you know, against the dust concentration, and the maximum value of that is what we, what you get is Pmax. So, so judging from all these little dots, you can see that in order to just get ourselves a, a KST and a Pmax value, we typically need to run between 10 and 25 um, rounds on the uh, on the 20 liter sphere. Now we can also do this on the one cubic meter and that gives it, and that, that helps you understand why it's so much more valuable for us from a time perspective to utilize that 20 liter chamber rather. Uh, down here you see the, uh, the, you know, this is the rate of change of our pressure, uh, which you can see corresponds with how quickly it comes up from you know, our normal pressure to Px. All right, so uh, when, we're, uh, when we're talking about the results of our explosivity testing, you know, a lot of times clients will call and say, what does it mean? And it's really just a measure of the consequence of the deflagration. How big is the boom that's associated with this dust? When, you know, if we ever, God forbid, have something happen in the plant, how quickly and how much pressure is going to be generated? These are what we need in order to design explosion venting systems, explosion suppression systems, and explosion containment systems. Now we can classify dust into a number of different categories based on the KST. Uh, you know, we've got everything from an, you know, a, a so-called ST0, meaning it's non-explosible, an ST1, which has a weak explosibility, but you know, I, I put that in parentheses because you know, even though we're calling it a weak explosibility, if you've, em if you've ever seen an ST1 dust uh, during a demonstration, it, there's nothing weak about it. But the reason we call it a weak is because ST2 and ST3 dust are much, much stronger and they're much, much more difficult to, uh, to mitigate. <laughs> so a couple of notes here regarding the uh, the ASTM 1226 testing, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion out there about how valid some of these tests are and when to use the 20 liter versus when to use the one cubic meter. So we're gonna start with the ignition energy. Uh, the ignition energy uh, can be varied depending on uh, how the test setup is put in place. Now, uh, ASTM 1226 allows you to use up to 10 kilojoules as your ignition energy, and a lot of labs will do that. However, 
at Duskcon, we recommend using a five kilo a five kilojoule total uh, ignition energy with two two and a half kilojoule igniters. Now, the reason we recommend that is we want to make sure that we're not overdriving the reaction. And now, what an overdriving reaction is is we're getting a false positive because we're using so much energy on the front end just from the chemical igniters in the first place that we can trick ourselves into thinking the material is combustible. And that's one of the advantages to using the one cubic meter sphere because the one cubic meter sphere uh, is such a large volume that it's able to dissipate the energy coming off of those igniters and you're not gonna see the same kind of pronounced initial uh, you know, jump in pressure just from the chemical igniters themselves. So in situations where a client of ours ends up uh, you know, thinking that they might have an overdriven reaction, a lot of times we'll advise that it's good to retest the material in a 20 liter sphere. Um, and you can go ahead and do that and see how it comes out. I've seen it both ways. I've seen some where we've got very low KST results below 15 bar meters per second in the, in the 20 liter sphere. We move over to the, the one cubic meter and we get the same kind of result. I've seen others where, you know, we get uh, Pmax values coming out of the 20 liter sphere of three and four bar. We move over to the one cubic meter and we're not getting anything. You know, it, it was obvious that it was overdriven. Uh, another thing that we, we should talk about when it comes to 20 liter versus one cubic meter is metal dust. Those of you handling metal dust, uh, you'll probably understand that they act differently than the organic dust that most of us are used to. When we're talking about dust explosions. Metal dust recently have, exhi have exhibited some interesting properties when it comes to the 20 liter sphere. We're finding that something to do with the volume of the one cubic meter sphere is causing uh, increased uh, KST and e increased Pmax values uh, from what we found in the 20 liter to begin with. So much so that NFPA 68 has specifically required that metal dust be tested in a one cubic meter sphere or that they are, uh, uh, or you double the values that you found out of the 20 liter for these specific metals, aluminum, magnesium, titanium, zircon zirconium, tantalum, and hafnium. Further, I want to make sure that we're, you know, we're being very careful when we talk about combustible dust to ensure that we're not ending up in a situation where we're marginalizing the risk because of the labels we're giving them. You may hear people use the words marginally explosible, hard to ignite, weak explosion. Typically, these are going to be labels given to materials that have uh, KST is less than 50 bar meters per second. And it's important to note that just because we've got a low KST value doesn't mean that the, there is no risk there. It doesn't mean that it can't ignite. And it doesn't mean that your, your process is safe because you came away with a KST value very low. We still need to be uh, weary of those risks, addressing those risks, and addressing them appropriately. So, KST Pmax 1226 testing, we've gotten ourselves the, uh, the consequences. We understand the severity of what happens after ignition. But what about before ignition? So, when we talk about uh, the limits of explosibility, you know, when you're going through uh, the combustible dust pentagon, and you know, you know, you know, need those five things in order to have a dust explosion. You need your fuel, you need your oxygen, you need your ignition source, you need suspension, and you need containment. Now, if we either take out the oxygen or the fuel, all of a sudden, we can't have that deflagration in the first place. So, that's where these two next tests come in. Limiting oxygen concentration, limiting ignition, uh, limiting, uh, excuse me, minimum explosible concentration. So, with the minimum explosible concentration, we're trying to uh, get a value for how much dust needs to be in the air in order to uh, support that deflagration. 
On the left, on the right hand side here, you can see that we've got uh, an image from Dr. Eckhoff's book. Uh, the, the, the image here shows that for coal dust, with an MEC of 40 grams per cubic meter. Now that value doesn't mean a whole lot, of, whole lot to a lot of people, including myself. So you know, to understand what it kind of means, we think about you know, if we're six feet away from a 25 watt, watt light bulb, there needs to be enough dust in the air that we would not be able to see the light. That's pretty tough to do. But there's certain process equipment that, uh, that we have in a lot of our plants or that's a normal occurrence. So if we're going to figure out what that is, uh, we utilize the minimum explosible, minimum explosible concentration test. Uh, it's run in a very similar way to the 1226, where we're dispersing material into either the 20 liter or the one cubic meter chamber. And then we're using a chemical igniter to attempt to ignite it. It's really going to be useful if we're attempting to design combustible concentration reduction systems, as shown with NFPA 69 would be the document you go for guidance for guidance there. Um, you know, a lot of users might try to say, hey, I've got a dust collector, say, and that dust collector is picking up very, very small amounts of material from the process. So maybe it's possible that we can utilize this MEC value and determine whether or not we even have a combustible dust explosion hazard in the first place. Now, I urge you to be careful when you're doing that because there's other things at play in a uh, dust collector itself. You, know, you may end up with a situation where, uh, where the pulse jets or whatever it is that's keeping that material from caking onto the bags uh, could be creating a dust cloud of, of that magnitude at any given time. So whenever you're going ahead attempting to use the minimum explosive concentration number as a basis of safety in your process, make sure you're taking a look at the broad range of conditions that might create such a uh, such condition in your plant. The other one here is limiting oxygen, oxygen concentration. So like I said, you know, if we eliminate any one of these five legs on our dust explosion pentagon, we're able to say that we're safe, right? So NFPA 69 uh, is able to use, uh, it, it shows us a way in which we can utilize uh, this LOC value to determine that we've reduced our oxygen concentration such that we, don't, we no longer have a hazard. And that's what you're getting at, and that's what you're getting here out of the LOC value. Again, we're using the 20 liter or the one cubic meter chamber, dispersing that material into uh, the volume. But rather than using compressed air, we're using nitrogen or carbon dioxide or some other inert, some other material other than oxygen to uh, keep that oxygen concentration relatively low. And we're going to uh, attempt to ignite the material in that vessel uh, using either a two and a half or a five kilojoule igniter. Staying on the ignitability, um, you know, how easily can we ignite the dust cloud using electrostatic energy? That's where we, we use our MIE, minimum ignition energy. And the minimum ignition energy measures the electrostatic energy required to ignite that cloud, right? You know, it's useful if we're talking about uh, bonding and grounding or other electrostatic protections being put in place uh, within the plant so that we don't ignite the material. Now, uh, the thing about minimum ignition energy is that it can be completed with or without inductance. Inductance uh, is utilized to increase the amount of energy that comes out from a given charge and it's going to increase the, uh, the hazard risk, and it's going to decrease the MIE value that is generated. Oftentimes, you're going to end up with an unrealistic conservative value that's not actually giving you a good understanding of what your material is doing. DustCon's recommending that you uh, do this without inductance. 
unless there's a specific reason that we think inductance could be coming into play. So if you're, if you're moving forward dust testing within a lab, I urge you to ask the question, have the conversation whether or not you're using inductance on your, uh, on your MIE testing. So then we come to what do these results mean? Now, you know, we get this result that says our minimum ignition energy uh, with no uh, added inductance is somewhere between 300 and 1,000 millijoules. But, you know, uh, to a layman like me, millijoules doesn't mean much. So let's get some context. Let's get some context here. Um, if you've ever touched a doorknob after wearing socks on, on, on a rug or carpet, touch the doorknob, you get a shock you're probably not creating anything more than about 20, maybe 25 millijoules of energy. So, you know, that little thing, that means that anything less than 30 millijoules is going to start to give us pause and start to make us think about the ways in which we need to protect our personnel, possibly using, you know, static dissipative, dissipative PPE or grounding our personnel with wrist straps. As we get even lower than that, you know, less than 10 millijoules, we're talking about a very high sensitivity of ignition. Not quite as high as some of the flammable vapors that you might come into play with uh, where you're looking at one to three millijoules, but it's important to know that we're on this lower, when we're on the low end of the MIE spectrum, we start to need to put in place engineering and administrative controls to protect our uh, to protect our employees and protect our assets. Now, on the other side of that coin, we are, we're also very interested on the high level. You know, if we're talking about more than a joule of energy, uh, you know, there's very few situations in which an electrostatic discharge can generate that kind of energy. So it, it, it puts into place whether or not we should even be uh, necessarily uh, looking at some of these engineering controls like bonding and grounding. So, you know, the interest for MIE is on both sides, not just from a, you know, we want to know for these easily ignitable materials, but also for the very difficult to ignite materials. And to give you guys some context around combustible dust, uh, you know, specialty chemicals are going to be the ones that you probably find with the lowest MIE values. I know that, uh, you know, a very common one in the uh, compounding industry would be sterates, and those are going to usually range between about five and twenty millijoules for your MIE. Uh, for something a little bit more common to the agricultural industry, sugar, uh, powdered sugar, you're going to be looking at a very low MIE, something like twenty to thirty range. But if you get it into the granular form, you might be looking at something as you know as high as three hundred. Uh, and you, you compare that to like wheat flour, which is going to give you an MIE probably above a thousand millijoules. So just to give you guys an idea of where some common dust lay, um, it is very helpful information uh, when you're going through your dust hazard analysis to understand what the possibility of ignition is. It helps you understand what kind of electrical protections you need to put in place and whether or not bonding and grounding is uh, needed for a particular application. Ignitability. Uh, we're still looking at ignitability when it comes to temperature. So there's two different um, applications which temperature could ignite your dust. On one hand, it could ignite it within the cloud form. And that's where we use ASTM 1491. It's important for applications like dryers, where you've got a dust cloud already formed and you're using like a hot, you know, hot air bringing it in. You want to know what that limit is. So that you're not, you know, maybe you think that you might be able to save some time on production, increase productivity. All we got to do is just, you know, crank up the temperature a little bit uh, on the incoming gas feed. That could have real consequences for you if you don't know this value and you're not utilizing it as a as a basis for safety. Uh, the other the other situation is maybe you've got a layer of your dust. Uh, maybe it's built up over a motor. That motor overheats. 
and you start to cause an initial fire. Now that fire is not an explosion, right? You, know, you can't have a deflagration from a layer, but that layer is going to be what is, uh, you know, charging you into a secondary explosion situation where you might end up getting even more damage because you've got that ignition source there. All it takes is somebody sweeping up with a broom or a disturbance uh, where you get something to you know, fall off, get a bunch of material to fall off a high ledge. All of a sudden you got your dust cloud and you start that chain reaction. Some other methods that you might be looking at, uh, combustibility screening. And you know, we've talked a lot about explosivity today, but combustibility is another one that, um, uh, that NFPA references. Uh, typically, you know, combustibility screening is going to be a little bit less common uh, when we're, we're going through the dust testing uh, array, but it's asking whether or not uh, the propagation of flame can occur in a layer. Volume uh, resistivity and relaxation, uh, that one we're going to use for very low MIE values. It helps us to understand uh, what fill rates we can use and uh, what kind of static buildup is going to occur as we do pneumatic transport. Uh, conductivity, drop weight impact, you know, these are going to be much less common uh, test methods that we use, but they are available and they are used in specific circumstances. So if you're having a DHA performed and your consultant mentions these, uh, you should know that they're available and it's something that you can have performed. So just to recap, uh, you know, we went over uh, how to collect your dust sample. We talked about the preparation, the fact that you can either go uh, as received or per protocol. Uh, we went through the go, no go testing um, that's going to determine whether or not your sample is explosible. And then we went through the list of different uh, explosibility testing options that you have as you move forward. Uh, the most common that you're going to see when it comes to engineering protection uh, for combustible dust is going to be your KST and Pmax. MIE and MEC are going to be really common for you if you're trying to determine whether or not you've got the conditions present to support deflagration. And with that, I thank you guys very much for the, uh, for the time and for your attention and for bearing with me as I got the speaker to work in the first place. I know that I was silent for the first couple of minutes, but I appreciate you guys having a sense of humor about it, working with me. And so we'll go on to some questions. <laughs>